Dan Gary coming to us from the University of Minnesota, uh, talking about generating pigs with humanized vasculature uh, using iPSCs to model human disease in large animals. Well, thanks a lot to uh, Joel and uh, GQ and, and Jay. Uh, I think this has really uh, become one of the uh, the, the most uh, collaborative and uh, uh, informative meetings that I go to. So thank you very much. Uh, the first slide really just schematizes the approach that we've taken over the years, uh, focused on trying to identify uh, factors that are important in the specification of, of cardiovascular lineages. And uh, we initially uh, discovered ETV2 as a downstream target uh, when we pursued a screen uh, looking for NKX 2.5 uh, direct uh, targets. And uh, using both an overexpression as well as a gene disruption strategy, we showed that ETV2 was absolutely essential for both the endothelial and the hematopoietic lineages. And we identified several downstream target genes. Importantly, we showed that uh, ETV2 also in progenitor cells repressed the, the cardiac lineage, the cardiomyocyte lineage. This slide just uh, further elaborates on the, the number of upstream uh, regulators for the ETV2 gene. We showed that uh, when we use uh, gene editing, we can uh, delete uh, the promoter fragment and uh, there's complete this extinguished expression of ETV2. We identified uh, interacting factors using both a yeast 2 hybrid screening assay as well as mass spec. We identified downstream target genes. And ETV2 is uh, somewhat unique in that it has a very narrow window of expression. And we showed that one mechanism by which uh, ETV2 expression is limited during uh, regeneration and embryogenesis is a, a negative feedback uh, based on FLT1 on FLIC1 to reduce the expression of ETV2. Uh, we've gone on, and over the past year, although I'm not going to focus on this today, but we've really spent a tremendous amount of time, as uh, John Cook had emphasized, uh, you know, looking at the role of ETV2 uh, as a pioneer factor. And John really emphasized the epigenetic regulation of various factors, but we've shown that ETV2 can bind to nucleosomal DNA, relax the chromatin, and allow really very early upstream regulators that are important in specification of various lineages to bind. And so this is a, a whole topic of, uh, uh, for another day that, that I'll talk about. But again, it just emphasizes that ETV2 is a, an important master regulator, but not just a master regulator, but also a pioneer factor. Now, uh, as Joel had mentioned, we're, we're interested in, in translating our basic science uh, discoveries really to uh, uh, impact uh, clinical medicine. And I just want to give you an update on our strategies that we're taking uh, to try to uh, re-engineer uh, the vasculature. And so we thought that ETV2 was an ideal candidate uh, when looking at trying to identify uh, a pig model that completely lacked uh, particular lineages. And this would allow if using interspecies chimerism, it would allow for a donor cell population to have an advantage because the host cells were unable to give rise to those particular lineages. So we used ETV2 uh, to introduce, hopefully, a, a niche that would uh, allow for competitive advantage for interspecies stem cells. So this slide just schematizes the approach that we took. We isolated a porcine embryonic fibroblast. We used CRISPR-Cas9 to delete ETV2. We established a cloning program in the, in the laboratory uh, where, again, uh, using a somatic cell nuclear transfer technology uh, alluded to by uh, uh, Joe Wu, that you can enucleate uh, the cells, replace them with the nucleus that have this mutated ETV2 gene, allow them to, uh, to develop in culture, and then at the morula stage, uh, engraft them into the pseudopregnant gills. So that's the strategy we took. This is just 
ETV2 is a relatively small gene. It can be completely deleted using CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, and this is the result that we had where uh, you can see in the wild type uh, control, there's clear evidence in this whole mount image of, of blood formation, uh, relatively pale uh, uh, ETV2 knockouts. These are non-viable by E18. In the pig, the gestational age is about uh, 114 days. In the cloned animals, it's about 126 days, a little bit more prolonged. So this is very early in development that these ETV2 no pig embryos are non-viable. You can see there's a, generally a growth retardation in the mutant compared to the wild type. And you can see that with this uh, tie to expression using immunohistochemistry, there's clear evidence of vasculature completely absent in the mutant as well as the blood components as well. Now we've gone on and uh, further characterized using flow cytometry in the mutant embryo at E18 as well as wild type controls using blood markers, CD45 and CD31 for endothelial markers, that while the wild type clearly, uh, wild type embryo clearly has these lineages, they're completely absent in the mutant, uh, lacking CD31 cells and lacking CD45 cells. Now, uh, if you culture these, these dissociated embryos, wild type and mutant embryos on OP9 cultures, you can ask, you can answer the question whether or not they have the progenitors that will give rise to these lineages but just don't express these cells. And what you can see using uh, 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 these uh, approaches that the wild type clearly has uh, all of these endothelial and hematopoietic lineages, uh, but ETV2 lacks these progenitors. Similarly, we've gone on and undertaken functional assays as well using colony forming unit assays, methylcellulose assays, and again at two different ages in the wild type, E18 and E21, wild type uh, embryos can form all three of these lineages, all completely absent uh, in the ETV2 mutant. And finally, we've undertaken transcript uh, analysis using qPCR in, in both wild type and the ETV2 mutant uh, embryos. As expected, uh, the mutant embryos lack ETV2. They lack vascular transcripts. They lack uh, blood transcripts. And there's an induction of the uh, cardiomyocyte-specific gene program. So uh, these results uh, suggested that uh, we were successful in uh, validating that these ETV2 mutant pigs lack uh, hematoendothelial lineages. And so we took a, a similar approach as I previously outlined, uh, only the, the next question that we thought was essential as really a platform for uh, interspecies chimeras is, is studies is to be able to validate that we could completely rescue this mutant phenotype using uh, porcine labeled, uh, GFP labeled uh, blastomeres. So we had to clone these uh, blastomeres uh, from GFP expressing fibroblasts. We introduced these, so this is the ETV2 mutant uh, embryo. And at the morula stage, we introduced uh, two porcine uh, GFP labeled blastomeres. Then we transferred them into the pseudopregnant gill. And so we analyzed these complementation studies, and you can see at um, uh, early during embryogenesis at E18. This is just a, 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 a whole mount image of the uh, complemented embryo. So this is an ETV2 mutant embryo that uh, has received GFP labeled blastomeres. You can see clearly the presence of blood and you can see widespread GFP expression. Every single uh, vascular uh, component is decorated with GFP labeled endothelial cells. Histologically, we see in these complemented embryos, every single TIE2 expressing endothelial cell is also expressing GFP as well. Moreover, every single blood cell is also GFP positive. We've gone on and quantified our, our studies uh, as you could uh, anticipate, and as we hypothesize, every single blood cell, every single endothelial cell was GFP labeled. This is important because 
we wanted to make sure that just rescuing this potential block that other uh, host cells didn't give rise to these particular lineages. So this told us that this was a cell autonomous defect. And importantly, uh, the, there is chimeric contribution to other lineages as well, somewhere between 10% and 30% to other lineages. Now we've gone on and while we showed that we could rescue those lineages, we wanted to make sure that we could rescue the lethality associated with the ETV2 mutant. So we looked at a, at a later time period, I believe this is E24. You can see that there's plenty of blood in these embryos that they're expressing GFP and that there's expression within, these, uh, within this vasculature. And importantly, we went on and uh, we were able to produce viable offspring. And I think this was an important study for us. It's the first that we know of where you're able to actually use uh, embryonic complementation to rescue a mutant lethal uh, phenotype. And so you can see that uh, there's clearly a, a well-formed uh, heart uh, descending uh, aorta. Uh, the aortic arch is intact uh, and the aorta is well-formed. And histologically, we see that every single uh, vascular unit is also expressing uh, vascular markers, or GFP, I should say, meaning that they came from the GFP-labeled blastomeres are expressing uh, tie to, but I think in this case it's von Willebrand factor. So these studies suggested to us that this was uh, a useful approach, that it would be successful, uh, and uh, it was really a necessary platform for then looking at interspecies chimerism. So uh, now we took this ETV2 mutant uh, pig embryo and uh, we then introduced uh, GFP labeled human IPS cells and took the same kind of a strategy. First of all, analyzing these in vitro, but then ultimately in vivo. So I think that there are similarities between what we're seeing, what uh, many in the cell therapy field are seeing is that you can, uh, you can appreciate that there's tremendous contribution of these cells, of these interspecies cells in vitro. The challenge, of course, is then taking that and enhancing that efficiency in vivo. So uh, shown here, uh, we've delivered uh, one, uh, one to two GFP-labeled human IPS cells in the early morula. And we've worked out the culture conditions to look at long-term culture uh, uh, situations for these chimeric embryos. And what you can see is that uh, those cells survive and they have a tremendous proliferative capacity uh, in, in vitro. This is shown here uh, uh, in another way in which, again, we've delivered two human IPS GFP labeled uh, stem cells into the morula allowed them to uh, develop. And what you can see here, uh, we can identify the HNA, HNA, human nuclear antigen expressing cells, and they all co-express uh, GFP. So you can see that they have a tremendous proliferative capacity. These embryos continue to develop. They even go to the hatching stage. You can see that they're hatching at this, at this particular stage. And uh, importantly, these cells are integrating within the ICM, and, and that's also important. We've gone on and we've shown, but this also, this emphasizes a couple of points. First of all, how small these human IPS cells and how large these uh, porcine blastomeres are. And uh, they do form uh, connexins, connexin 43. They also express integrins as well that allow them to integrate. And, uh, last year, I showed you some slides where uh, they actually, when loaded with calcium, will, will spread calcium, which is propagated via the gap junctions. So we've gone on, and, and we've, we've done a lot of these studies. We've cloned 15,000 uh, pig embryos uh, last year. And this is, uh, so this is a very efficient uh, process in vitro. It's a very inefficient process in vivo. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for us in the uh, upcoming year is to increase this efficiency. I'm just showing you a, a set of studies done over the course of one month. 
and you can see that you know if this is our our uh, assay, we're we're generally seen somewhere around one to ten thousand, one to a hundred thousand cells. So it's a very inefficient process. I'm going to show you uh, evidence where believe that they're contributing to the capillaries, and we're just we just received this uh, high level. Uh, Chimera, and we're analyzing this as well, where these are, uh, are, are much more robust in this particular embryo. So we've developed uh, unique uh, tools to uh, uh, evaluate uh, unequivocally human cells that has no uh, cross-reactivity with pig tissues. And what we can see is that in the ETV2 null, these human IPS cells certainly can contribute at, at low magnification and at high magnification. I say these are low mag, these are high magnification of these uh, capillaries, but it's a rare event. And that's really what our challenge is going to be, I believe, is uh, it overcoming apoptosis and uh, proliferative or senescence, if you will, of these particular cell populations in vivo. So what I've told you today is that uh, we think that ETV2 is an ideal candidate for these kinds of studies because not only is it a master regulator, but we believe that it's also a pioneer factor as well. Um, and it clearly lacks these lineages. Um, using uh, uh, cloning and gene editing, we're able to show that uh, using uh, pig GFP labeled blastomers, we can completely rescue the null phenotype and those are viable animals. Uh, we see that in vitro, we can form a real uh, high percentage of these human porcine chimeras. Uh, the biggest challenge is in vivo. And I think this is uh, an area that we and others are, are spending considerable amount of time. And I think there's going to be a lot of, of uh, additional information that we can all share because I think that many of the same mechanisms are seen whether you're looking at early embryos or you're looking at um, uh, adult hearts. And then I just want to finish by highlighting those that did the work, uh, uh, those that had done the cloning, uh, uh, Gun Ho and, and Xiao Yan, those that had done the analysis, Naoko, all this has been done in collaboration with Mary Grace uh, and collaborations with Jay and Tim Camp and Joe Wu. Thanks a lot.